Father, we praise you today. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to present your word to a lost and dying world, Father. I come to you in Jesus' name, Lord. I ask for your help this morning by your spirit that you would minister to your people through your word, through this message, Father, for your glory. That I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If I could give this message a title this morning, I would call it Perspective. I looked it up in Webster's Dictionary and a few other ones online. And perspective is a, a seeing and understanding. It's also uh, being put in comparative things that you would get a greater understanding of what it is that is going on. And so it's an understanding. It's also um, being able to see to be able to look at things and put it into that, uh, the, hence perspective. And so we're going to start with Matthew, cha- I'm sorry, uh, Mark chapter 5. We're going to read through verse 20. Then he came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains, and in the tombs he was crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when Jesus from afar, when he saw Jesus from afar, He ran and worshipped him. And he cried with a loud voice, and he said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains, and so all the demons begged him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about two thousand. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned into the sea. And so those that fed the swine, and they told... they. Those that fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one that had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those that saw saw it, they told him how it happened. Uh, Come on, Ray. (laughs) And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine and they began to plead with him to depart out of their region and when he got into the boat he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him however jesus did not permit him but said to him go home to your friends and tell them what great things the lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you and he departed from there there's a lot of things that you can look at from this and we're going to break it down as we go. If you see this background back here, I wanted to put things into a perspective so you can get the an understanding of just how big this herd of swine was. I printed off an extra page. This one sheet has has 300 pigs on it. I printed off seven pages to give you an idea how big, to give you a visual, how big that herd was. At seven pages at 300 is 2,100 pigs. One of the versions of the scriptures I read, King James from uh, from the house, said that uh, there were about 2,000. Was it an exact number? What's it matter? Okay, just say there was only six pages worth. That's 1,800 pigs. If you look at the number of them, that's a tremendous amount of pigs. If you want to put it into another perspective that you can also get a better visual with, everybody likes a good visual. 
if you gave, say you have 250 to 300 pound pig, and it's reasonable to believe that that was about the size of them because even in today's marketplace, how much you feed the pig, the cost of feeding it, the cost of raising it versus the pound for pound you get back on it, your best price and market value is around a 300 pound pig for your best profit margins. So we're going to figure 250, 300 pound pigs. If you give each one of them a 10 by 10 space to live in, to feed in, to move in, times that by 2,000, that is a one-third of a mile square. From the entrance of the church, it's one-third of a mile up here to the Dollar General store. Then one-third of a mile up that way, that way, and then back to your starting point. That is a lot of real estate. And so when they saw, when this whole herd, how big this herd was, then we'll get to that. But when you look at the man that was possessed, it, the Bible says that no man could restrain him, not with chains. They couldn't control this man. When somebody is possessed of the devil, you are fighting a spiritual conflict, and you can't do it in your flesh. I have a friend of mine who was, uh, him and his wife were in their home, and this man that was their neighbor came in and violently attacked them. He said he knew the man. He said to me one night as I was talking to him, he said, but what I saw in that man's eyes was not the man that I knew. And that man pulled out a knife and started slashing and stabbing at my friend. He said, I tried everything in my power to restrain him. He goes, but there was no control in that man. He said, when, I, he said when, you, when they say that you can look into the eyes of people and you see pure evil, he said there was nothing there but darkness utter darkness. He said the only way he could protect his, his family and his wife was to run, and that guy followed him. They life lightened him out. They flew him out to York, sewed him back together, and praise God he's still alive to this day. The way man dealt with that was to get this guy back on his medications. So many times, spiritual things in this realm that we live in, in this modern age of today, they shuffle these people off to the doctors, to the psychologists, and these psych wards, and all they want to do is hop them up on dope, get them on these drugs, these mind-altering drugs, and put them into a state of zombie land. But they're not delivered. They are possessed. The church world doesn't deal with the possessions anymore. They shovel people off to their doctors and psychiatrists and everything else. That's not how Jesus dealt with this man. There's some other points I want to point out with this man that was in the tombs running around possessed. It doesn't matter how possessed a person is, how driven by the devil you are. If you want to come to Jesus, Jesus will set you free. He who... He will set you free. He had enough wherewithal that he came to Christ. He had enough wherewithal to know that it was Jesus. He fell down at the feet of Jesus and worshipped him. Yeah, the devils took over his tongue and started talking. But he had enough wherewithal in his heart that he came to Jesus. Call unto me, is what the Lord is saying. And I guarantee you, Jesus will set you free. But it's up to you. You've got to be wanting to absolute surrender everything in your life in order to be set free from the things that have you bound, set free from the demonic torments that have you bound. You've got to be willing to surrender absolutely everything in your heart to Jesus Christ. Then you can be set free. I've cast devils out of people, and I'm telling you, it's easy as all get out to cast the devil out of somebody. It's very easy. But it requires several things. It requires you to be full of the Holy Ghost. It requires your name to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The disciples, they came to Christ, and they said they were in amazement how even the devils were, they had authority over the devils. And Jesus said, rejoice not that you have authority over the demons, but rejoice rather that your name is written in, the, in heaven. 
And so that's where it is. This man, he had enough wherewithal to choose. He chose to run and worship and fall down to Jesus. He wanted set free. And that's when the devil spoke. There are a few points I want to make about these 2,000 pigs. And I'm looking at the physical aspect of things. Demons themselves desire to inhabit flesh and blood. I've heard of people saying how houses are haunted and this is that and that is this. And yes, I can attest to that. There are truths in that. There are entities that people invite in wherever they live because of the things they're doing. The witchcraft they're dabbling in, the horoscopes, the black magic, the witchcraft, and anything else, the pornographies and whatever else. When you're dabbling in those kinds of sins and et cetera, et cetera, you're inviting the devil into your residence. You're inviting that spirit into your body. And I'm telling you, but devils desire to inhabit flesh and blood more than they do an empty building. Notwithstanding, they, there can be presence there. And the reason devils want to inhabit flesh and blood is because they don't have bodies themselves, but they are spirits. The Bible says that the devil is not in hell cooking right now. Neither are his little devils. He is running about on the face of this earth. He is running to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. That is what the Bible says. The Bible does not say that Satan is in hell, but he is running back and forth looking that whosoever he can devour. Our conflict is a spiritual conflict. We fight a live enemy. He is a living spiritual being. When them pigs died in the ocean, them spirits did not die. Them spirits are going to live forever. Where they live is between them and God, because my Bible says that they will be cast into the lake of fire on that final day. Spirits do not die. Them same spirits are floating around, running around, doing whatever they want to do. They haven't been cast into hell yet. But that day is coming. That day of judgment is coming. Pigs are smart enough that they didn't even want the devils in them. They didn't even want the devils in them. And they ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They cast themselves into the water and they drowned. There's a few facts about pigs. They can swim. So how is it them pigs died? Because you have 2,000 pigs jumping in on top of each other, and that water was turned violent. So, of course, yes, they drowned. When you get 2,000 jumping in on top of each other, they don't have a chance to swim. It was a Jewish town, supposedly, as I've heard. So what were they doing with pigs anyway? Pigs were unclean to the Jews. They shouldn't have been raising hogs. I got to thinking about this whole scenario the other day, or even yesterday, even this morning I was thinking about it. The Sea of Galilee, it was the bottom right, well, we'd call it southeast side of the, the sea. It's a freshwater lake. There are no sharks. What would have happened to all them pigs? Oh, I'm sure they were able to take and barbecue some of them. But in the coming days, there would have been a terrible mess. Terrible stench, a terrible death of everything else, polluted water, and who knows what else that would have happened. That was a catastrophe. But praise God, that man was sitting there in a sound mind. What did it cost? What did it cost the people of that area for that man to have a sound mind? It cost them 2,000 pigs is what it cost them. Plus the repercussions of everything else. The death, the stench, the days that were to come. 
the gut pals, the mess. But it was worth every minute of it for that man to be set free. To what extent is God willing to set somebody free? What if a man ends up being a million, multi-millionaire and has a construction firm? What if he loses it all for the salvation of one soul? It's worth it. It's worth it all. You see, there's no value on your soul. It is priceless. It was paid for with the shed blood of Jesus. And there is no value you can put on that soul. Jesus died for us. He rose again from the dead for us. He shed his precious blood for us that we could be forgiven. There is no value. Without price, your soul is utterly so precious to God. So what's the cost of 2,000 pigs? Nothing compared to the man that was now saved sitting in his right mind. I'm going to cover some spiritual aspects. When it comes to spiritual matters, you need to know who you are in Christ. You need to know that you are bought. You need to know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You need to know who Jesus really is. And perhaps here by the end of this message, I'll go into First John, or I'm sorry, John chapter one and Colossians chapter one, and I'll read them, because Colossians one and John chapter one, they expound who Christ is. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was at the beginning with God. He is the one that came from eternity. He is the one that came as man. He is the one, the living one. He was in the world, the world was made by him, yet the world knew him not. He is the living one. You need to know who Jesus is. You need to know what he has done for you. You need to know what the Holy Ghost is doing in our lives. You need to know him. You need to know the authority that you have in him. When I speak to devils, they go. I don't sit there and mamby-pamby them things. I don't sit there and talk to him for an hour. I don't sit there and beg him and plead him. I speak to him with absolute contempt. I command you, foul spirit, to just leave. And it doesn't have a choice in the matter. It must go. That is the authority that Christ gave to us. You need to know that. You need to know who you are in Jesus. You need to know the kind of authority that you have in Christ. He said, the works that I do, so will you. And greater things than these will you do because I go to the Father. When Jesus spoke to them demons and said, go into the pigs, he told us that we would do the same things that he has done. How come we're not seeing it now? We're not seeing it now for a number of reasons. The number one is doubt and unbelief. And the second reason is, is when the disciples came to him and said to Jesus, how come we couldn't cast the devils out of that man? Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. Nevertheless, these kind only go out by much prayer and fasting. It's a life of prayer. It's a life of surrender. It's a life of seeking the Lord. It's a life of just being in a place of submission to him day and night. Allowing him to have his way in you. Giving up your sleep. Get up at three or four in the morning and start praying in the Holy Ghost. And start living in that realm. And then whenever the storm comes, then you're going to have the authority to speak to it. When the devil starts rising his head up, then you're going to be moving by the Holy Ghost and you'll speak to it without even giving any thought to it. And you'll tell the Spirit to come out and go. And it doesn't have a choice. The Scriptures say, I want to go back to man can't fight this battle in his flesh. If your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, I'm here to tell you right now, you are not going to have authority over any demon. You will not have the authority. In the book of Acts, there was a fellow by the name of Sceva. He was one of the high priests at the time. His seven sons went and approached this devil-possessed man. 
They said, we adjure you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches to come out of him. That one man that was so possessed, he looked at the seven sons and he said, they said, the spirits spoke through him. They said, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? And that possessed man beat those seven boys violently where they left that synagogue wounded, bleeding, and half naked. You cannot fight a spiritual war in your flesh. You will lose. If you are not born again washed in the blood of Jesus, you will have no authority over that spirit at all. You need to know who Jesus is. You need to have that right relationship with him. You need to be in a place of constantly abiding and be filled with the Holy Ghost. The scriptures say that one will put thousands to flight and two will put ten thousands to flight. You can follow that through. I'm not going to dig it up. Joshua chapter 23, verse 10, Deuteronomy 32, verse 30, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 17, Leviticus 26, and verse 8. I do want to tell a story of uh, one of the evangelists, Joan Pierce. She was up in New York City, and she was holding in a uh, missionary outreach up there on the streets of New York City. Her and her team had been praying. They were of one mind, of one accord. And there were people in suits carrying their briefcases that were dropping in the middle of the sidewalks and crying out to God. Weeping, surrendering their lives. They were dropping all over the place. you got to get enough God in your life that whenever you walk by, the devils tremble. You want to make a difference in this world, then it's going to require every one of you out there, and myself included, to press into the deeper place of God and allow the Holy Ghost to manifest through us in such a way that we've never seen Him manifest before. The book of Acts was not a one-and-done one deal. The book of Acts is for us today. If we're not seeing the manifestations in the book of Acts today that they had back then, then we are missing it. Do you want a book of Acts church? Do you want to be a part of that? Do you want to be a part of what God is doing? Do you want that kind of authority? Jesus said, He said, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. He told us in Luke 10, over, he gives us the authority over all the power of the enemy. He gave us that authority. I remember Kenneth Hagin one time, he was talking about the difference between power and authority. And there is a difference. Christ has the power. We have his authority. He gave us the authority over all these things. The policeman, back to the story of Haggins, the policeman standing out in the street and a dump truck's come rolling up through full of boulders or whatever. Policeman holds up his hand and the truck stops. It's his authority, the authority of that badge that made that truck stop. It wasn't his power. If he went out in his, his power to try to stop that truck, he'd have been run over like a pancake. Wouldn't have happened. But he has the authority. You and I have the authority in Christ. Christ has given us the authority to go on and carry on the work that he started. He said, and one of the very first things that he said was this, you will cast out devils. He said, if you believe on me, the works that I do, so will you. You will cast out devils. You will heal the sick. You will cleanse the lepers. You will raise the dead. How come we're not moving in that realm? Praise God, I know I am. I haven't had the opportunity to cast out no 2,000.
But I know, I know one word from the, from the Lord, and it is done. Just speak it, and it is so. Let it be unto you according to your faith. People say they know Jesus. No, you don't. Or you would definitely be acting different. If you really truly knew Christ, you'd be giving up that sin. If you truly knew who Christ is, you wouldn't even consider wallowing around in your whatever you're wallowing in. You'd be giving it up. You say you want a closer walk with Jesus, then let's see where your feet are. Are you walking to church? Are you making every excuse under the sun not to get there? What are you doing? You say you want a closer walk with Jesus, and yet you're glued to your video games. No, you don't. You don't want a closer walk with him, or you'd be turning that off and pressing more into his word. You want to get closer to Jesus and closer to the Holy Ghost and allow God to move through you and manifest himself through you in all the signs and wonders? Then it's going to require you to sacrifice yourself. It's going to require you to turn off that television. Your video game, maybe it's your cell phone that's the big hindrance. I don't know. I'm not here beating anybody over the head, but I'm telling you right now, quit deceiving yourselves. You want a greater authority? You have all the authority under in heaven. Don't you know your authority? Don't you know where Christ seats? It says in Ephesians chapter 1 that we are seated with him in heavenly places. We are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. Where is Christ seated? He is at the right hand of the Father with all power and glory. And if that same Jesus lives in you, that same Spirit lives in you, the same Spirit that raised Christ up from the dead, if He dwells in you, you have all the authority that Christ has. He gave it to us. Speak to that mountain. Speak to that devil. Speak. Speak to that sickness and command it to come out in the name of Jesus. And I'm telling you people, sometimes you've got to get mad. You've got to get mad at the devil. Jesus said the works that I do, so will you. I can't help but think. When Jesus went into that synagogue, he made a scourge. He was talking to his disciples. He knew he was going to go into that synagogue. He knew. He said, this, the scripture says, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. He was done with their status quo. He went in there with the scourge and he beat them. And he flipped those tables of the money changers over. He flipped them over in a holy anger. Don't tell me Jesus didn't get mad. Don't tell me he didn't move with force. Don't tell me. And many times when you see when the disciples put out the unbelievers and made them leave the room, don't tell me they didn't get mad at the unbelief. I actually had that happen when I was down in Trinidad. The Spirit of God come on me. Sickness was sweeping through. The Spirit of God come on me, and a holy anger rose up in my heart. Some other lady broke into the kitchen door and started yelling about the one needed a doctor and needed an antibiotics. That was the icing on the cake. I started yelling and throwing around. I started yelling. Everybody get out. Not another word about pills and doctors. In the name of Jesus, all the unbelief, get out. I'm going to pray for every one of you, one at a time. The evangelist said, you want me to leave too? I said, no, I'm going to pray for you first. I took her by the hand because sickness was coming up onto her. I took her by the hand and I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I command a sickness to come out of my friend. And immediately she hacked up all kinds of phlegm and she was healed.
I'm not saying you have to yell at everything. Please don't misunderstand me. But there's times when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you will start raising your voice and you will get mad at the devil. You will get mad at that sickness. You will get mad and you will take authority over it and you will command it to come out and command it to go. But do you mean enough business? There's been times that I've been moved with absolute compassion. And I want to share this couple stories with you. Because not every time I go to pray for the sick do I yell. Not every time do I command the devil to come out in my yelling. There was a lady I overheard one time. I was sitting at the garage. She had an equilibrium issue. They gave her pills. Well, the pills made her drowsy to the point where she couldn't function. And then they gave her exercises to do, and her still, her inner ear was still jacked up. And she said, I don't know what, she was talking to another woman. I was clear to the other side of the garage when I heard her. And she said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just deal with it. I just can't. I, I walked over, and I got up into her business. And I said, I overheard you. May I pray for you? She goes, yeah. So I took her by the hand very gently. And I said a very simple prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, will you heal this late young lady? I finished my business and I came back a couple days later to get more parts. Then I approached her and I said, so how's that whole inner ear thing going? I no sooner got that out of my mouth and she blurted out, I haven't had a problem with it since. Whew. So not every time do we have to yell and command diseases and sicknesses to come out or devils to go. But there is a place of authority. When you speak to the devil, he has to listen. It doesn't matter. If it is not instant, it doesn't matter. Because as you read through the scriptures, you'll see where Jesus, where it says that the, the devil came out within the selfsame hour in places. But with authority, you do have authority over all these things. Christ has given us that authority. We need to know our authority. I want to read Colossians chapter 1. You need to know who Jesus is. You see, John chapter 1 is a very good chapter, but I'm going to also read Colossians 1. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. You see, people, it was Jesus, the Son of God, that commanded these demons to come out of that man, and they did. He has given us the same exact authority he really has, according to the power that works in you. He wants us there. He wants every one of us to walk in the likeness of of himself. It's up to us to get there. Let me finish reading Colossians 1. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven which is laid up for you in heaven to give us an expected end. The Lord said, I know the thoughts that I have toward you, thoughts to do good for you, not of evil, but to do good and to give you an expected end of which you have heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it was in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth. And also, as you learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister in Christ of your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason also, since we have uh, the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and ask that you be filled with all knowledge of his will and in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you would get it, that you would understand his will, that you would get the spiritual understanding. You have the authority. 
Christ has given us the authority to act on his behalf. He's given you the authority to do the same thing that he's done. 2,000 pigs later, he's giving us the authority. Paul's praying here for, the, for them that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may come into the fullness of Christ and know who it is that you are in him and that you may know that who he is. Whew, that's a tongue tangler. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and enter increasing in the knowledge of God. Here is where you're going to get your knowledge of God. Here. The Word. Stay in the Word. That's where you're going to get your knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, for patience and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, into Christ's kingdom, into the power of Christ and the authority that Christ has given us. He has created us to be like Him. Do you believe that? In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He, Christ Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Are you ready for this one? Are you ready for this one? John chapter 1, read it for yourselves, but are you ready for this one? For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. All things. He has given us authority over all things. When Christ is in you, you have the authority that he had. You can move like Jesus moved. He wants you to move like he moved. It's going to require faith on your part. You're going to have to have confidence in God knowing that he's got your back. You've got to have confidence in God knowing he is going to do the very thing that you ask. According to his will. According to his purpose. How in the world are you ever going to find out his will and purpose if you never get into this thing and read it? Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Praise God. Because Jesus came to set the people free. He came to set the captive free and give them liberty. That should be our mission too. The very thing that Jesus did is what we ought to do. Praise God forevermore. But is it in your heart? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and all things he may have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to pre present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, if you continue in the faith, if you continue in the faith, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if, 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 if indeed you continue 
in the faith it's contingent upon you staying in the faith staying in a place of surrender this whole concept of once saved always saved say a prayer and you're good to go forget it pal you're going to wake up on the other side and you're going to be sorry you ever did that and those that teach it and those that preach it you're going to be horribly finding themselves mistaken and there's nothing they can do to undo it if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which, Paul, I became a minister. Come to Jesus, get into that place with him. Start moving by the Holy Ghost. Start surrendering more and more of your life, staying in the Word. Start learning more of who God is and who Christ is and who Christ, who Jesus really is. Press it into a deeper place. He said, the works that I do, so will you. When he cast out that many devils and they all went into the pigs and the pigs ran violently down a steep place in the hill and drowned themselves in the sea. The man was sitting there by the boat in his right mind clothed he begged jesus may let me go with you and jesus said no but go back to your own country and tell your friends what great things god has done for you he became the work of an evangelist and he started doing the work of an evangelist you have the authority christ has given it to you Jesus is not down here running around doing the work. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. We are his eyes, hands, and feet. We are the ones that are extended. We are the ones that are here. He has given us the authority to do the work of the Father. He commanded us to go and do it. You need to develop your confidence in God. You need to know who you are in Him. Colossians chapter 1, go back and reread it for yourself. Read it slow. John chapter 1, read it for yourself. Read it slow. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, read them. You need to know who Jesus is. You need to know the authority that He has. He's given it to us to continue the work, to continue. It's a lot of pigs. It's a lot of devils. And all he said was, go. Well, Father, I've delivered this message today. I've done the best I could. The rest is up to you. You said you sent your word, and it would accomplish the very thing where you sent it. And so, therefore, Father, I pray the ones that needed to hear this message that they've heard it. They apply it. And that they surrender more of their life to you and that you would manifest yourself through them by the Holy Ghost. And all these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.